Again, in this series, we're just, we were trying to discover God's blueprint for building his church. Amen. And it's important if you're going to build a church for God to do it his way. Amen. So uh, today I want to talk about team ministry. Team ministry. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 4 says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Amen. There was murmuring, the scripture says. Murmur is to uh, mutter and grumble and uh, just kind of complain. But there were seven murmuring recorded against Israel. And number one is concerning the way, concerning the food, concerning the giants, concerning their leaders, concerning the divine judgment, concerning the desert, concerning the manna. These are all things that people were murmuring about in, when they were in is, uh, Egypt, coming out of Egypt there. And Paul says that the saints... To, he said to the saints, neither murmur ye in, in 1 Corinthians 10. And in Philippians chapter 2, he says, do all things without murmuring. So Paul's saying, look, don't complain. Quit complaining, quit murmuring and muttering and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, so the problem was that there was too much work for the pastors to do alone. So people were sitting back and saying, this needs to be done. Why ain't they doing this? Why don't this, why don't somebody get this done and fix this and fix that and all this kind of stuff. So there was too much work going that, need, that needed to be done. And so instead of getting, saying, let's, let's do it ourselves, let's help out ourselves, they were murmuring and complaining. So God's solution was to appoint deacons. A deaconess is a servant, one called to serve, to wait on, or an attendant. So these men were to be of honest report, having a good testimony inside and outside of the church. They were to be full of the Holy Ghost, having a real relationship with God. They were to be full of wisdom, having the necessary skills to do the job. Uh, the word deacon does not refer to an official church board position. A lot of people think that's what a deacon is. But it is to ministry role in the church. So if you work in the church and you help out do things in the church, you are a deacon. We just don't use that term much. And there's some people that do, and that's, that's fine. But uh, that's what it is. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13 says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. How, why did he do that? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ. <clears throat> that word for, you could say is, say it as so that. So if you read that, instead of saying for the perfecting of the saints, or you could say so that the perfecting of the saints. All right? This is not a threefold job description of the fivefold ministry, but rather God's plan for team ministry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 27 through 30, he says, now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, government, diversities of tongues. All are apostles, all are prophets, all are teachers, are all workers of 
miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. See, Paul's style is to use the rhetorical question that implies negative answers. Romans 3.3, 3, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? So what he's saying is, look, if you don't, somebody doesn't believe it, does that make God with no effect? No. It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what, that you understand the Word of God and live according to the Word of God. Because you're going to stand before God and say, well, I didn't believe that. And God, what do you think God's going to say? Oh, I'm so sorry. I should have shared my thoughts with you. No. God's like, I'm sorry you don't believe. It doesn't matter to me. I'm God. Right? Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? The question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is he saying, he's saying that you can just go do whatever you want and, you know, because of God's grace? You're taking advantage of God's grace? Well, you know, the old saying it's easier to get, uh, to, uh, get forgiveness than it is permission. Well, uh, uh, God's not going to play games with you. God, has, his grace will go a long ways, but not if you're just taking advantage of him. So, implication number one, not everyone is an apostle. Not everyone is a prophet. Not everyone is a teacher or worker of miracles, etc. Folks, but in, in implication two, since helps and governments are accepted, it shows that anyone can have them. Okay, you can have these things. During the Dark Ages, a distinction was made between clergy and laity. It was a trick of Satan to reduce and continue, or, or to, to reduce and confine ministry. Okay? So Satan says, look, I don't want just anybody that, you know, that, that wants to uh, grow in God and become a, a used of God. So he, he, made, he made a trick here, and they had this distinction made between clergy and laity. Only certain people could be clergy, could be a, a minute pastor or whatever. And that's just not true. Okay? And he wanted to do that so to reduce and confined ministry. God wants to use anybody. He will use anybody. Amen. If, and, and, and I've said this many times. All you have to do is say, God, I want to be used. And devote yourself to doing the things of God. The problem is a lot of people want to be used, but they don't want to devote themselves to do what they need to do to where God can use them. God won't use you if you won't do it his way. Right? You have to do it God's way. And, and, and so the, the, the reason a lot of people uh, are just okay with just sitting on a pew and not getting involved is because, well, I, I can still go to heaven, but I just don't want to do, I don't want to get involved so much that it takes all my time. Come on. Come on. See, this, is, this was taught by Nicholas, this, all this thinking here the, that there's, you know, only certain can do clergy and laity stuff. It was taught by Nicholas, who was one of the original deacons in Acts, Acts chapter 6. He was not content with having a ministry, but wanted to have a role of pastoral authority. Again, it's like I said, some people don't want to do what it takes and live the life and things that God wants you to live and give up certain things and have to do certain things and on and on and on, but they want that position, okay? They want that authority. And, and so the teaching that exalted pastors above measure uh, actually reduced all the overall effectiveness of the church drastically, so, you know, God was saying, look, God wanted to use everybody, and anybody that, you know, wanted to and would live that life, God would use them. But see, that was because of this kind of teaching that was held back. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 15, it says, so, thou, so, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, which things I hate. So in reality, every member of the church has a ministry. Okay? 
You've heard me say this before. I'll say it again. And, and f- hopefully someday it'll, it'll sink through. But every member in the church has a ministry. Everyone. The saints are the ministers and the pastors are the administrators. Okay? They're still ministers, okay? But they, you have to have somebody lead. It would be just chaos if we come in here. And you know how, you ever, you ever say, somebody, uh, who wants to do this? And some people sit back and just kind of just hoping that somebody will speak up. Okay? Could we imagine if we didn't have a, you know, I wasn't your pastor here. And we come in and said, okay, who's going to get up and speak today? Huh? What would, how would that go over? Huh? Everybody, everybody would be looking around like, you do it. You do it. You know? Right? Who's going to organize? You know, look at over the years and stuff, how we've grown into different department heads and all this kind of stuff, and we have meetings and all this kind of stuff. Who, who would do that if we didn't have anybody leading in the church? Do you think you would continue to come to a place that didn't have any leadership? You know, listen, we, you know, I don't know about you, but I, when I come up with a red light, sometimes I'm like, I hate red lights. But I couldn't, I couldn't fathom living in the city without red lights. Their their necessity, aggravation. They always take too long. I like those quick ones, man. You park, nobody go. But we have to have that stuff, right? I mean, look, just just some of the actions going on in the city here over the last several years, it's been crazy. I've I've complained to my council lady who lives four houses down from me. I said, this is like like a wild, wild west around here anymore. People just do what they want. Come on. You got to have people that are going to lead and going to hold things together and and enforce laws and rules. And so uh, saints are the ministers and the pastor are the administrators. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 11 says, But all things worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing, dividing to every man severally as he will. Every member has gifts. Every member has at least one talent. You read about it in Matthew 25. Everybody has one gift, or at least one gift, and one talent. All right? Depending on their God-given ability, every member can exercise either the gift of helps or governments in some way. Okay, there's something you can do. But so often, folks, everybody wants to say, you know what, I, I, let somebody else do it. You know, I, I've told you I, I, years ago, I, I, I need to dig it out again and probably teach it again. But I talked, I did, a, I did a, a lesson on the little red hen. You know the story of the little red hen? Anybody know that? Was it read to you as a kid? No. You know, the, 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 she had the, the, the chicks. She wanted to make bread. And, and she's like, who wants to help me uh, plant, the, plant the seed? No, not I, not I, not I. Then when it comes time to harvest it, who wants to help me harvest it? Not I, not I, not I. And once she grind and asking everybody all this, through all the steps, nobody wanted to help her. When it was, who wants to help me eat it? I will, I will, I will. You see, we all have a part to do. And we need to understand that. And, folks, we are going to answer to God if we don't do our part. Praise the Lord. God gives you things. He expects you to use it. You read the, you read the story in Matthew about, you know, the man that hid his one talent. He was cast into everlasting darkness. All right? So God gave you that not to hide away, not to store it away. He gave you a talent to use Okay, and so you know, I, I'm a firm believer that uh, uh, we, can, we can grow into things. We can learn things. Uh, I tell people, I said, uh, Noah was not an ark builder until God got a hold of him. You know, he didn't, he didn't look for uh, getting the yellow pages to look for an ark building company. Right? No. God says, hey, Noah, yes, God, I want you to build an ark. What's an ark? There was no need for arcs. But God used this man, and he was willing to be used of God. 
And listen, sometimes doing things for God and getting involved, people don't under, people in your life, in, in, in your everyday life, in your family members, they don't understand these things. Noah was made fun of. He was the he was the butt of a lot of jokes, you know. And it took him years to build this. And can you imagine people down down the streets doing different? Like, what do you think about that guy down? Look at that. You see the big ark in his backyard? Is he? He's lost his mind. Have you ever seen anybody build something like that? And, and, you know, and I'm sure when they see him going to the marketplace, hey, Noah, is it raining in your backyard yet? They didn't even know what rain was. He was constantly being made fun of. Think about his sons. They were helping him. Dad, are you sure? Man, all my friends, they don't even hang out with me anymore. They think I'm crazy. And, you know, and when we get involved in the things of God, folks, and we live for God, and that becomes our life and things like that, people think we're crazy. And, you're, and some people who, quote, unquote, supposed to be a friend, they no longer want to hang with you because you're the oddball out anymore. But look what happened. Because he obeyed and because he did what God wanted him to do, he saved his household. His family was saved. Everybody else was lost, folks. But his family continued on. And they, 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 were, the, they were what was left of, of, of all people at the end of the flood. It was him and his family. And sometimes, folks, in order to when we feel God's leading us and directing us to you know, be the leader in our home, it's not always popular. Being a leader is not always popular. You have to make sometimes, you have to make decisions that aren't popular. Not everybody likes your decisions. So, depending on, on their God-given ability, every member can exercise either the gift of helps or governments in some way. So, what is the gift of helps? <clears throat> some people think it's a crutch. Uh, Antipolis is to participate or support. It's not an official capacity or title, but you're just helping. David said, I'll, I'll, be, a, I'll, do, I'll be a doorkeeper in the house of God. I'll open doors. Just let me be a part of something. Right? Let me be a part of something. Just let me help in the kingdom of God. I just want to see the kingdom of God. I want to see Church of Pentecost be the best church there is. So, it's not necessarily a supernatural gift, but rather natural gifts sanctified by the power of God in the life of an individual. I just want to do something. We should have that. You know, all that God has done for us, we should say, I want to do something for God. I want to be a blessing in the kingdom of God. I want to be a help. Amen. That's the very least that I can do. Is to do something for God. God uses, folks, God uses natural to be a blessing. All right? Your natural gifts. Thus bringing supernatural benefits. All right? He, he used the natural. He said when he did the loaves and the fishes, he just, somebody gave him fishes and, and loaves. All right? Uh, the pots for, for the oil. He used the natural to fill with oil. God uses those things to, for the supernatural. And there's, I'm telling you, you use what God has given you, be in, uh, help out in the gifts of helps, God will bless you spiritually. He wants to do that. And some gifts of God can be the development of the natural capacity. All right? You can, you can learn to play a piano. All right, you can learn to use a weed eater or whatever it is in the church. You can learn these things. Some people today in this day and age, it blows my mind sometimes, are not even try, willing to learn things. Here, let me show you how to, and the whole time you're trying to show, I can't do this. I can't do this. You've already made up it in your mind that you can't do it. Okay. My wife tries to keep, teach people to sew. Some people, the whole time, I can't sew. I can't sew. I can't sew. Folks, you don't even know what I put my wife through sometimes. When she, we first started coming over here to church, she didn't play piano. And, and she, would, she would practice 
during the week. I give her four songs for Wednesday night or th three songs for Wednesday night and so many, and so many so songs to, to play on Sunday. And she'd practice them all week. Well, sometimes I get to church and say, we're going to sing this song. She, it wasn't on her list. She looked at me and I'm like, you can do it. Just do it. You can do it. And, 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 and she did it. She was just willing to do. And, and it happens. My boys were never allowed to say, I can't. Don't tell me you can't. That means you don't want to. And you will do it. You don't have a choice. See, I believe that God, God, when he created this noggin up here, there's something that's called the brain. All right? You can put, if you put your mind to something, you can do it. Okay? But the, the most of the people don't want to do. You know, there's some things out of necessity we learn. All right? When you own a home, it's, it's not always... Uh, affordable to bring somebody else in to do your work. <laughs> when you own a car, it's not always affordable to always just have to take it to a mechanic. Right? So there's things that we try to learn on our own. Now, you know, we, we may bust our knuckles a few times or smash our fingers a few times with a hammer or whatever it is, but, uh, you know, and it may not be perfect, but we did it. Right? And thank God, in these days, you can go to YouTube. And that person wasn't perfect at it, but at least showing you what he did. <laughs> I installed all my windows in my house. Saved me thousands of dollars. The first, uh, what, four or five? They didn't have YouTube back then. But I couldn't afford to bring somebody else in, and somebody helped me get some windows, and I put them in. And they were rough, but they're still in. One of them I didn't put in. One of the first four or five, whatever it was, I didn't put in. And uh, see, I didn't measure them just exactly like, so I did a lot of shaving. And so I still have to shave that one, and so it's still in my basement. It's the only one I ain't got in. Oh, no, I got one, two more. Two more windows. I'll have, I have 30-some windows in my house. Okay, so they're all in but two, and I got to get these done this summer. I got to paint my house this summer. But see, you can do things if you put your mind to it, if you put your mind to it. And, and I'm all about trying to do it myself. The older I get, the more I want to try to let somebody else do it because it's just harder on me. But. I've done all my remodeling, pretty much all myself, in this church too, in this here, this platform, all this was all done. I didn't have YouTube back then. <laughs> but we can do things if we put our mind in it. God gave us that, that ability. And, 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 and a lot of times we just don't want to think. You think about all the inventions, somebody just thinking about something. My dad was always trying. To, you give my dad a welder, he'll build you anything you want. So, you know, it's amazing what we, do, we can do if we put our mind to it. And folks, if you want to see God's blessing in this church, if you want to see revival in Church of Pentecost, put your mind to say, God, I want to do something for you. You know, we ask God to save our family members and do all this kind of stuff all the time. But you think we could move God? And I'm not saying you're going to do, get, get all the blessings by your works. But I'm thinking sometimes if we just put our more effort in our part, do what we can, God can bless us more. Amen? Some are so busy looking for spiritual jobs that they miss God's plan for them. Some people want that uh, position uh, of of uh, being the the spiritual leader or the the uh, uh, you know the pastor or whatever it is that kind some gifts of God can be the development of a natural ca capacity like playing the piano and doing things in the church mowing grass whatever it is that kind of stuff yet these helps were through worthy were thought worthy to be mentioned with the apostles prophets and teachers and etc. 
They were, they were mentioned too. Some are so, but people, some people are just so busy trying to be, look for that spiritual job that they miss out on what God wants to use them for. And, and listen, folks, God help you know, just like anybody. You bring, hire somebody into a company, and he may start out in the a low man on the totem pole, but he is such a good worker, and he's always looking to try to work hard and do this and do that, that they move him up. And people are looking, especially in this day and age, they're looking for good workers. They're hard to find, right, Brother Carl? They're hard to find. So we have to just say, look, you know, we watch people and say, hey, are they willing? Are they, look, they don't know. You know, I've, I've started in many places in low man and just work hard. And people enjoy hard workers. And so that's what God is looking for. And God can take you places and, and do. We were, me and my wife, and, and uh, even before I met my wife, I was always just willing to do something in the church. And just, you know, I was going, I, was, I had family trying to talk me into going to Bible college, and that's, a, that's all right. You can, whatever. Uh, my pastor took me aside and said, look, stay here, work with me. I'll teach you everything you need to know, need to know about work, being a pastor. And I just worked right alongside with him, doing whatever I can. Do whatever I can. And, and being faithful. Just being faithful. You know, I told you the story a long time ago about messing up. And, you know, I, I, after that, if he asked me to do something, it was done. Okay? If I told him I'd do something, you can count on it being done. And so, some, so, so helps today in the church that you can get involved in. In our churches, the AV ministry, the music ministry, the Sunday school, small groups, greeting, ushering, and goes on and on and on. Helping in the, in the lawn, all these kind of things. Uh, you know, in wintertime, shoveling snow. There's a lot of things that people can get involved in and do. All right? Let's not just sit back and want to eat the loaves. Let's be a part of what is going on here. So what is the gift of governments? Some people say it's a paddle. You guys are hard crowd this morning, I'm telling you. You're hard, all right? So I'm trying to say some of these words. Kubernetes, Kubernetes is to steer or to direct, okay? The, the gift of governments. Paul was familiar with the sea and the ships. He was in the ship wrecked three times. Said that Hananias and Alexander had made shipwreck concerning the faith. Used many analogies like this one. This term applied to ships of the day which were steered by many, but under the leadership of one. Okay? So, these, when, they, when they were operating these ships, there were people doing all different kinds of jobs to get the ship where they wanted, but it was directed by the captain. All right? He couldn't do it all himself. He couldn't go putting up the, the, the sails and running over here and steering this and doing all the different things. I don't know what all they do on ships, all right? But there's a lot of things. There's a, there's a crew to make sure things are done. And, and he couldn't do all of that. He had to have help. And so Paul, that's what Paul was doing here. He was making this analogy. And uh, so this term applied to the ships of the day. Steering them, directing them, getting them to the place they needed to be. The word can refer to deacons and elders, etc., who help steer the church, but not exclusively, not on their own. All right? We all can steer the church by how? Unity. Unity in our prayer, unity in our work. It takes more than one man. And, and I've said that I've said that from day one. I came and took this church in May. In fact, May third was 24 years for me and my wife pastoring this church. 24 years. But when I came in, I told that church it was a little just a handful of people. I said, "This is not a one man show. All right, it's not going to be a one man show. So you got to get involved and help." And that's what I've always tried to do is encourage people to get involved in helping to grow this church, amen, and to be what God wants this place to be, what God wants it to be. So it applied to the ships of the day, steering them. So we can steer this, but we have to do it together, all right? We can get where we want to go, and we're headed toward heaven, okay? This is just, you know, different stops.
steps along the way. We need to steer the church around problems and into revival. Every member can help. All right? Uh, anybody ever done canoeing? Oh, look at that. All right. So do you like it when you're in the canoe and the person in, with you or the people with you don't want to help? Huh? What are you doing? Get your paddle in the water. Right? Help out. You know, you're sitting there, and you're not used to canoeing. You don't do it. It's not a daily thing. You don't canoe to work every day. All right? So it's hard. You, don't, you use muscles you don't use, right? And so you're there, and you're, you're thinking the person's behind you helping you. Look back, and he's like. And you take a paddle, and you just whack a bunch of water on them. Get your paddle in the water. And that's the way it is in the church, folks. We want everybody to be on board. We want everybody to help. All right? Be a part of it. Praise the Lord. And, and we'll get where we want to go. What are the best gifts? What are the best gifts? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 31 says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. A man by the name of GM, uh, G. Shalom said, The best gifts are those which enable an assembly to be edified at a particular time. Our churches would definitely, uh, definitely benefit from helps in government. They do. But many people want their gifts to be the ones that get noticed. All right? Many people want the gifts to be the ones that get noticed. There is many times an artificial division between those who help or work and those who govern or direct. And a lot of times this hurts the church and it is frustration to the ministry. All right? Many people secretly feel that everyone else should think feel, act, and become involved in church ministry exactly like they do. I'll say that again. Many people secretly feel that everyone else should think, feel, and act, and become involved in the church ministries exactly like they do. Okay? <clears throat> Let me give you a little story. It's called the animal school. A group of animals decide to improve their general welfare by st starting a new school <clears throat> in which the curriculum consisted of running, climbing, flying, and swimming. And all the animals took all the subjects. The duck was good at swimming, fair at flying, but he was terrible at running. So he was made to drop the swimming class and stay after school to practice running. He kept this up until he was only average at swimming, but average was acceptable. The others, including the teacher, were no longer threatened by the duck's swimming ability, so everyone felt more comfortable except the duck. The eagle was considered to be a problem student. For instance, in climbing class, he could beat all the others to the top of the tree. But instead of using his own method and getting there, he had to be severely disciplined. And finally, because of his non-cooperation in swimming, he was expelled for insubordination. The rabbit started it at the top of the class in running, but was woefully inadequate in other areas. Because of so much Makeup work, he constantly had to go back and take another classes for swimming. He had a nervous breakdown and had to drop out of school. The turtle, oh, he was a failure in almost every course offered. His shell was considered to be the leading cause of his failure, so it was removed. And this did help running for him a bit, but sadly... He became the first casualty of the new curriculum when he was stepped on by the horse. You see, folks, they were, wanted everybody to be the same. They didn't want to look at the eagle with his abilities to climb. So they made him work harder in other areas 
and he became less inactive in his good areas. And sometimes that's what we want. We want everybody to be the same. Some people excel in certain areas where others don't. Let them excel. Okay? Let them excel in those areas. And, and just let people do th what they do. You know the thing about it is, it's, it's such a beautiful thing that we have a God that is accepting of that. I'll take you with your abilities. But yet we are often the, time, the ones that hinder those areas. If one of these animals dropped out because of the frustration. Do we want to drive somebody so much in areas that they're not good at instead of letting them excel in areas that they are that they say, forget it? You know, and I'm not saying these things about that we're all doing this. I'm teaching here, folks, because you see, I believe if we keep things before people, it helps us. You know, you've heard me say many times, folks, uh, everybody knows that McDonald's exists. Is there anybody that doesn't know that McDonald's exists? Anybody? You, you guys all know that McDonald's exists? But they advertise all the time, don't they? Okay? So, reason I, one of the things I believe, if you want people to do something, you keep it before them. All right? And I bring this before us. I teach these things and help us to go and go, to be better. And sometimes if you let people excel in areas, it gives them, you know, they do so good at it that they say, you know, I'm going to try something else. But if they are the ones trying it and, we're, and not, we're not trying to cram it down their throat and you give them the time, they can become better. You know, over the years, all of us folks have become better in areas because we continue to do things. And so uh, that's what we need to do. We don't want to be forcing people to do things that they're not good at. We don't want them to feel bad that they can't do something. Why can't you do this? I don't know, but I'm really good at this. Yeah, but you should be doing this. Again, I, I, I'm not detracting from what I said earlier, that we can all do things if we just put our mind to things. But sometimes it takes a little longer to learn. Okay? You know, when I was very young in, in school, I was in a, a special reading class. But I've, over the years, continued to get much, much better. And I can read really pretty good now. You know, and, and so we, we all can grow at things. But people grow at things at different sp times. Just because you're not good at it right now doesn't mean you can't be good at it later. And it's amazing how that if we want to do something, if we really want to do something, we can become excellent at it. Okay? But you got to let people do things at their own pace. The fault with this kind of divisive thinking, this animal school, lies with both parties. The spiritual who are waiting for their chance in the spotlight and won't work. And the workers who back off of the spiritual areas just because of a few extremists. <clears throat> in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 22 and 23, Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. So a translation of that is, two parts which do not look beautiful have a deeper beauty in the work that they do. <clears throat> how, important, how important is your hand? Very important. Have you ever seen anybody still alive without a hand? Hmm? How important is your heart? Very important. Have you ever seen anybody still alive without a heart? Huh? Hands are important to us, right? We all want our hand. We don't want to lose it. But you can still exist without a hand. See, your heart, the hand, is very noticeable. But the heart, which is very, very important, it's not noticeable. You don't see the heart. 
Um, you can go up and put your hand on somebody or ear on somebody's chest. And you can hear the heartbeat, or you can, you know, you can put your whatever they put their fingers and stuff to f- make sure that you're still flowing. You're still uh, what they call alive. You know, so you can see it. You know, you can see us walking around. So you figure the heart's beating, All right? But you don't see it. But it's there. It's so important. And there's things that go on, folks, in the church that you don't always see. But without them, it doesn't happen. Without it, it doesn't happen. Now, there's all the limelight, okay? There's the hand stuff that's moving. People see it. And sometimes we, we mistake things, folks, how, how important that is. And people, people long for those positions sometimes, But see, you don't always know who's cleaning the church. Could you imagine if we didn't have people clean the church? Would you be here today? With all the mice droppings from coming in here, finding all the crumbs that nobody cleaned up? All the ants crawling all over stuff because somebody didn't clean up cookie crumbs? It's important. Aren't you glad that you can go downstairs to a nice, clean bathroom? Hmm? It's important. But you don't see it always unless you come here on Saturdays or go downstairs after services on Wednesdays and sometimes whenever they do some of the other stuff. You don't see that. Thank God Sister Denora runs a team that does all the cleaning. Hmm? Aren't you glad that grass is mowed? But you don't see Brother Mike coming over here Friday and mowing the grass. Brother Alejandro spraying the weeds. Right? But see, if you didn't have that done, there's a lot of rodents that live in that kind of stuff. Tall grasses and stuff. And it don't look really good. But it's needed. It's needed. There's a lot of things behind the scenes that need to be done. But we like the hand, right? Folks, some fruit can only be brought forth in the shade, right? Can only be brought forth in the shade. It's very crucial. Mary and Martha, Martha the worker, <clears throat> she got distracted from Jesus when the cares of the physical realm got too heavy. But Mary, the worshiper, got distracted from Jesus when the cares of the spiritual realm got too heavy. You see, at the death of Lazarus, Martha went to meet Jesus, then had to return to the house to get Mary. The bigger the team, the more important or more impact that it can, they can have. Right? The bigger the team, the more impact they can have. It's called the Pareto Principle. The Pareto Principle is 20% of your time yields 80% of the results. 20% of your people do 80% of the work. 20% of people eat 80% of the food. That's the Pareto Principle. I'll say it again. 20% of your time yields 80% of results. 20% of your people do 80% of the work. 20% of people eat 80% of the food. We need more involved. Amen? Anybody ever heard of Herman Melville? Who's Herman? Who's Herman? Moby Dick. He wrote Moby Dick. Anybody ever read that? I think they asked you to read that in school. Herman Melville in Moby Dick, he said, to ensure the great efficiency in the dart, the harpooners of the world must start to their feet out of idleness and not out of toil. Now, I wonder what he's meaning by that. Anybody know what he's meaning by that? I'll say it again, to ensure ensure the efficiency of the dart, what were they doing? They were hunting a whale, right? How did they hunt the whale? With a dart. 
with a spear. So to ensure the efficiency of the dart, the harpooner of this world must start, or must start to their feet out of idleness and not out of toil. Remember I said Paul's talking about comparing working as those on the ship? Okay? There's a lot of things going on in the ship. The, the, just because you're out there on the sea doesn't mean it's like glass and everything's going nice and smooth. It doesn't matter what you're out there for. If the sea brings up a storm, you're a part of a storm. In Herman Melville's Moby Dick, there is a violent, turbulent scene in which a whale boat scuds across the floating ocean in pursuit of the great white whale, Moby Dick. <clears throat> the sailors are laboring fiercely. Every muscle is taut. All attention and energy is concentrated on the task. The conflict between good and evil is joined. The chaotic sea, the demonic sea monster. Versus the, the morally, morally outrageous man, Captain Ahab. In this boat, there is one man who does nothing. He does not hold an oar. He does not perspire. He does not shout. He is weak in the crash and the cursing. This man is the harpooner. Quiet and poised and waiting. You see, and then this sentence, to ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harpooner of this world must start to his feet out of idleness and not from a toil. Melville's sentence is next to be alongside the psalmist. In Psalms 40, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. And alongside of Isaiah 30 and 15, in return and rest shall ye be saved in quietness and conf confidence shall be your strength. Listen, folks, the harpooner has to be ready for the time. See, that whale doesn't always surface, and you have to be ready for the time. And if he's too busy toiling, if he's too busy fighting the waves and rowing and, and trying to get the, uh, the uh, what do they call them, sails up and all that other kind of stuff, he might miss his opportunity for that whale. So he has to be sharp. He has to be ready. He has to be watching. Anyone who knows the first thing about living intensely in grace knows that there must be quietness and leisure at the center. Christians throughout the centuries have protected and nurtured that center by meditating on Scripture and praying. And folks, pastors are harpooners of sin and responsible for throwing the net of evangelism. In Acts 6, 4, but, he, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In 1 Corinthians 16, 15, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that is, of the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have ate, addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. What I'm trying to say in, in this here, and in, in, in I will build my church, is we need to understand that it is not a one-man show. And to sit back and say, why doesn't pastor do this? And why doesn't pastor do that? Why doesn't he have this done? Get involved. Okay? The harpooner has to be ready. And if he's all the time over here fixing the sails here and moving over here and, and steering it this way and doing that, he's going to miss the opportunity to hit that target. It's, it's our church. I've said this. I've always said this. This is our church. It's not my church. Amen. Help me to grow this church. Help me to steer this church to where it needs to be. Help us to get to where God wants us to be. How many here want revival? Come on. Hallelujah. Where does revival start? In your life. In your life. Revive me, God, to be what I need to be. When God revives you, then you can have family members that need to be saved, saved. When God revives you, you can reach your neighbor. When God revives you, you can reach your coworker. Folks, let's build the church. I said, let's build the church. Amen. Let's stand. Amen.
quickly. If you need to run, we're going to have service here in a minute. It's going to start here in a few minutes. If you need to run out of the bathroom or something, take a break. Uh, hurry and get back up here. Let's, let's see what God's going to do in the next half. <laughs> 